Welcome to the Pop Culture Retrospective podcast. Uh, my name is Amy Lewis, and today I am incredibly excited that following um, a snowstorm here in Maine and injuries, uh, that I am able to welcome uh, author and speaker, Mr. Chris Clues. Um, just a little bit of an overview for before we uh, get started on uh, discussing pop culture here. Um, he is a graduate of Ellen University. He spent over 20 years working in the field of marketing, partnering for sponsorships with well-known organizations, perhaps you've heard of them, the NCAA, the MLB, and the UFC. He is a professional keynote speaker on life and workplace lessons that we can learn from 80s pop culture, which is amazing. He is the author of the book series, The Ultimate Series on Essential Work and Life Lessons from 80s Pop Culture. And I actually have... I'm the proud owner of, of two of those books, and they are excellent reads, which we'll talk about here momentarily. Uh, also wrote uh, Raised in the 80s, and all of these books, um, I have looked at them on Amazon, and they have uh, a plethora of excellent reviews, and I think that's certainly very telling about his expertise and writing ability. And he is very passionate about animal rescue organizations, which is wonderful and near and dear to my heart as I had two adopted dogs myself. Um, a lot of proceeds, I think, from your books uh, go to a Wonder Paws Rescue that I think led to you adopting your dog, if that's correct. Yes, that's correct, Bodie. Yep. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of a, just kind of a brief condensed bio. Is there anything that I left out of that, Chris, that you wanted to make sure to add? No, I just, uh, it's Elon University, so E-L-O-N, Elon, um, although, you know, Ellen University sounds cool, too. So. It does. I'm from, I'm from Illinois, so I kind of, my vowels are often um, yeah. off when pronouncing things, yes. That's okay. I'm from Baltimore. We get, we, we get uh, made fun of for the way that we say O. Oh. That's okay. why if you ever go to, uh, I'm, I live in Florida now, but I grew up in Baltimore. If you ever go to a, a sporting event where there's a Baltimore team, during the national anthem, when they say, oh, you'll hear a bunch of people say, oh, and people think it's, oh, are they being disrespectful? No, no. It's actually making fun of the Baltimore O. Okay. So just if you're ever at a sporting event anywhere in the country, there's a Baltimore team. Okay. You will hear that. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good to know. There's like, yes, there's like-minded people. Every once in a while it comes, it comes out. My Midwestern accent has mostly faded, but every once in a while those vowels just, uh, get me every time. Yeah, same um, for me. Same for yeah. me. <laughs> okay, good. I'm in good company yeah. then. So yeah. thanks. Thank you for your for your uh, empathy for my mispronunciations. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, all right. So, so you mentioned you grew up um, in Maryland. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I grew up in a just kind of a suburb of Baltimore City. Uh, and I was there till um, through high school and then uh, went to college in uh, Elon in North Carolina. And um, after that, graduated and wanted to go somewhere warm and it was either California or Florida and I just picked a path and went with about $200 burning a hole in my pocket and nice. uh, that was back in 1993 so uh, yeah growing up in Baltimore um, you know obviously I'm a huge 80s pop culture person I um, have so many fond memories of the pop culture and uh, you know we talk about music and movies and how they take us back to a certain time the the smells the yes, sounds, indeed. the yep. visuals, it's, that's what makes, you know, I, I guess we, we refer to it obviously as nostalgia, but particularly in the music, I hear a song and I'm immediately transported back mm -hmm. to my car that I was sitting in at 16 years old, blasting my stereo with Bon Jovi or something. And so I, I, yeah, nice. I definitely, um, I, I have a huge, um, I guess affinity for my, for the eighties, except for the fashion. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I know I always joke. It's like I live really close to a college campus. And it's like, my God, if I would have just hung on to some of those stonewashed jeans, you know, and some of those neon colored items, my hyper color shirts, I could have made a fortune. Off of oh, yeah. The ones that you kids. touched, you know, yeah. you touched yes. it and then it turned a different color. And yeah. 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 Like, oh, I yeah. should have. Man, I could have sold all that stuff for a, a nice little profit there. <laughs> hey, before um, we go any further, yeah. I do want to yes. thank you for the megaphone because I think, you know, people they hear podcasts and they just see the, the end result, but the work that goes into it on the back end for somebody like you, who's an independent podcaster without people like you, I wouldn't have a voice. And so I really appreciate the megaphone that you give me. I know the work that goes into it and, and I truly appreciate that. So I want to thank you for that. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that you, um, you've certainly done such an amazing job of connecting with indie podcasters. Your, your presence on shows is very admirable um, of what you kind of, you know, it's kind of a win-win um, for us podcasters too, that you're willing to 
you know, put yourself out there and uh, teach our audience about what you do is pretty amazing. So thank you likewise for your support of us, you know, yeah. uh, grassroots uh, podcasts. It's, you know, it's much appreciated, but people like me and yourself, you know, are very passionate about this topic. And so it's nice to have somebody who's so sincerely, um, you know, passionate about 80s pop culture is, you know, something that I certainly am drawn to and appreciate. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, so what's something you kind of, I mean, I guess touch on a little bit with like the music and stuff in the clothes, but what do you think you remember the most about growing up in the eighties? I, for me, it's probably the friendships. Uh, you know, there's, um, the movie stand by me, which is mm. just a, you know, a great short story by Stephen King. Um, yep. but an even maybe, could I even say a better movie? Uh, it's, it's just a fantastic movie, but there's a, the very, the line at the very end. Uh, where he says, you know, I never had any friends like I did when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? And yeah, that really, um, that hits me and it relate. I really relate to that. And I talk about that in my keynotes, speaking engagements. I talk about some of these life lessons from 80s pop culture. And I do focus on that one. It's really important to remind people, you know, that there are still people out there that you, you had all these adventures with, you know, a summer day lasted mm -hmm. forever. And yes. it felt like it lasted an entire year. And there were so many adventures you could have in that one day. Mm -hmm. And you did that with that same core group, typically. Not everybody, but for me, right. I did. You know, I don't want to speak for everyone. But for me, I had this core group of kids. And unfortunately, a few of them have passed away. But a few of them are still here. And to reach out, it makes your heart feel good. It makes their heart feel good. And we have mm -hmm. social media. It gives us the ability to stay in touch with people now, unlike we did in the past. So yeah. we can see what they're doing, but it also makes us complacent. Oh, well, I see what so-and-so is doing, so I don't really need to reach out. Yeah, you, you, you should. You know? It's so true. It is amazing how because it's so easy to reach out to people, it's almost like we don't. You know, it's yeah. like we did a better job when we had to write somebody <laughs> letters. You know, I remember writing my friend's cards in college and, you know, when I was away, um, there's no Facebook or Twitter or, you know, Instagram or whatever. It was all completely, you know, analog, if you will. Um, you know, handwritten letters and I've saved all those and they, um, you know, mean a lot more than any Facebook post would, you know, for sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Handwritten notes. We'll get into that. I have a great lesson on that as well. Oh, good. Oh my God. That's priceless. I'm trying to get back into that actually. Um, all right. So you're, you mentioned, you know, you're, you're a keynote speaker, you're an author, um, mm -hmm. which has been, I mean, just fascinating to learn about and such a great little niche that you have there. Um, at what point in your previous career, kind of touched on it a little bit. So at what point in your previous career did you tell yourself, you know what, I think I need to do something different? Yeah, so I was, uh, gosh, I just sound like a Valley Girl right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. Great movie, by the way. Uh, so I, um, I was in kind of a place where, you know, I'd 20 plus years in marketing. I love marketing. I, I have a passion for it. Yes, I can, I can tell that it's very knowledgeable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I felt like there was something else out there for me and I just, I wasn't sure what it was. I mean, I thought, am I going to go through my entire life and at the end of it, they're going to say, yeah, he was a pretty good marketing guy. You know, and is that going to be my legacy? Because I, I never had kids, you know, so I'm not going to have that piece that leaves, that I leave behind um, mm -hmm. to continue kind of what I'm doing, hopefully. So I thought, what can I do? And I was having a self-pity party of one. And uh, I was on the couch watching The Breakfast Club. And Bender says, screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. Now, I had seen that movie a hundred times, but I sure. never really listened to that line. I'd heard it, but I never yeah. really I shot right up and I said, my screws have fallen out. I'm in an imperfect place. What am I going to do to put them back in? And so mm -hmm. I started thinking about it. I thought, you know, am I going to kind of be like what Henry David Thoreau said back in the 1840s, even before people were kind of in cubicles or even working in factories for that matter, that, you know, the massive men or the massive people will call today, the massive people lead lives of quiet desperation. Was I going to hmm. just lead that life of quiet desperation or yeah. was I going to do something different? And so I decided to, instead of putting those same screws back in and keep going down that path, I got a whole new set of screws, a whole new door and a whole new journey. And, and I, and I thought, what is it that I can do? And I knew about life. I knew about work and I knew about 80s pop culture and I said, how do I put these together? And so it started with that simple line, wow. which I created an article, you know, what the breakfast club taught us about problem solving. And mm -hmm. I put it on LinkedIn and people responded to it. And I thought maybe I have something here. Yeah. Um, so I went from there. Wow. That's amazing. It is. It is. Yeah. It's funny how like one little thing um, can kind of, sorry, I'll edit that yeah. out. Um, can kind of speak to that um, because I, 
really appreciate it. I've been reading um, your your second book here, and um, I became a photographer sort of later in life, um, kind of unexpectedly because somebody asked me to take um, photos of their daughter for high school, and that kind of led me down this totally, completely different path. And um, as I was reading um, this book, so it's the, the second in the series, um, What 80s Pop Culture Teaches Us About the Workplace, Today's Workplace, 10 More Iconic Movies, Even More Totally Awesome Business Lessons, and one thing sort of stood out to me that you wrote in here because you're just a really um, very talented writer, and I'm not just saying that because oh, you're because you're here. You. Um, I, yeah, very just easy to absorb in the in the best way possible. It's just very just very clear, very distinct, very inspiring. Um, and you said in the chapter on the outsiders, uh, but daydreaming doesn't have to be just a dream, and it most certainly doesn't have an age limit. If you find yourself at work and at home consistently thinking about a passion project that continues to find a little space in your head, whether it's 1 p.m. or 1 a.m., which that happens to me all the time, uh, <laughs> then it's time to make that dream a reality. Don't be afraid to walk out on that plank and take your leap of faith. It doesn't matter if you're in your first job or are a seasoned executive and leader. As Johnny Cade said, you still have a lot of time to make yourself what you want to be, create you. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's amazing. I, that really <laughs> spoke to me a lot. Um, because I, you know, worked in education for, uh, you know, with kids for 20 years and kind of like you, you know, had this sort of like light bulb moment, uh, you know, a little bit later in life and, you know, realized like, I don't have to do this. I can do something completely different. So I think that's something that people can really relate to and what a great path you've, you know, carved for yourself with this, um, you know, passion of yours. It's just, just incredible. Well, I appreciate it. And if anybody didn't know, and thank you very much for the compliment, because I, I yeah. do try to write in a way that um, hopefully is relatable and Definitely. conversation rather than me speaking to somebody. I want it to be a conversation. I want it to be, you know, um, open ended and I want people to feel like we're sitting in a room talking. So that means a lot. And of course, if anybody didn't know you were an educator before, they would know if they saw the your the, my book with the uh, post little. Post oh, book. yes. Yes. Um, Mark in the pages. Clearly, that's yes. a feature right there in our education for sure. Yes, and oh, I'm yeah. very particular about the post-its. I like these ones because they're smaller. They're not, you know, not yeah. huge and they don't rip. So, yeah. yes, you know you worked on education when you value good <laughs> school supplies. And yeah, supplies. and the outsiders, I want to point out that, the, you know, the Johnny Cade thing about you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. That was another driver for me. You know, I was 46 years old. I wasn't, you know, 25 or 35-year-old entrepreneur. Yeah. I was 46 years old. I mean, not old by any stretch, but not where I think the typical entrepreneur, people think of the typical entrepreneur and where they yes, start. Exactly. Uh, so I tell people that all the time. It doesn't matter if you're eight or 80, you know, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. What is it that you want to be? And that go create you is a real thing. Like you, you know, we have this one time here and, you know, we could have a bigger discussion about whether, you know, we come back later or whatever, but yeah. this one time that we know. Okay. So we know sure. we're here this one time and you have that opportunity to do what you want to do. And I think that that Henry David Thoreau quote, quote really resonates with me, that that quiet desperation that so many people I think go through life and they don't even realize it. Yeah. You know, because that that passion that they have is a hobby or an interest. They're like, this is a fun hobby, or I enjoy doing this in my free time. Yeah. Well, how much free time do you actually have? Not a lot. So if it's being captured by one thing always, why not try to find a way to make that you know, a living. And, um, I don't know. I just think, you know, and, and it's life gets in the way we talk about that and it's a real thing for people. Yes, definitely. Uh, there was another quote that, um, and I always forget who actually said it. So I'm probably going to attribute it wrong if I say it, but it's something <laughs> to the effect of, um, that, you know, one of the, one of the saddest things is that people, when people die with their music or songs still inside of them hmm. and that idea that, you know, so many people miss that, opportunity or don't go for it mm -hmm. and um they they go through life with a particular career but ultimately there was something else that they loved and they just never got to it and uh i think that that's a really powerful quote particularly when you are blessed with having a full lifetime yeah you know that an entire life you know whether it's 75 or 80 years when you're blessed with that time to be able to uh to take advantage of it and do something that you love yeah Definitely. I, I'm very grateful that I've been able to, 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 like you said, take a leap of faith and do something completely different. It's, it's crazy, but incredibly exciting all at the awesome. same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, so to go back to your um, your, your speaking engagements and your, your keynote speaking, um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of what that looks like? Yeah, so, uh, well, it started because of this whole this whole thing of writing these books. Mm -hmm. And after the first book, I thought, you know, I, I was on stage as a kid. I did a little bit of acting when I was a kid. And, you know, I kind of, I like being on stage. I don't like necessarily being the center of attention off stage. Sure. But I do have a little bit of that, what Tupac said, all eyes on me. Oh, um, a little bit of that. Oh, there you go. I didn't even know you had Perfect. a shirt yep. on. Where am I yeah. rocking my Tupac shirt today? Yep. Yeah. I do have a little bit of that all eyes on me. I mean, it's it's you know it's nice when you're up on stage and you know what you're talking about, of course, and and you're 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 confident in that content. So uh, yeah, I built a website, positioned myself as a speaker, and started getting out there and saying, hey, this is what I do. And so what I typically do, like for example, this Thursday I'm speaking to the American Marketing Association, uh, the Iowa chapter. Nice. And so and then in a couple of weeks I speak to UPenn Medicine for the second time. You ever spent some Yeah, exactly. Oh, People whose IQs are much higher than mine. Uh, so. I'm speaking to them for the second time, which is really exciting as well. And it really depends on what they're looking for. Typically, I'll come to the table and say, here, here are some core lessons that I think are great for everyone, whether it be leadership or workplace culture or teamwork or life. And mm -hmm. then I want to understand what the theme of their particular event is or conference or even their organization. What are the challenges that you're having? Where are the struggles? And I'll usually have some lessons because I have about 150 lessons from about 35 movies. Oh, um, and I just keep making That's more and incredible. more. Yeah. <laughs> and I and I usually have something. And if I don't, I'll create it. You know, I'll say, okay, let me let me go back to the drawing board. I'll create a few lessons to tackle this particular challenge or solution from a particular movie. So um, that's usually how it works. It's a conversation about what they're actually looking for in terms of content. And then I'll present a little bit of my uh, presentation to give them a flavor for the style and tone. It's very interactive. Yeah. It's very relatable. It's supposed to be that way. I get up on stage. One of the first things I say is, look, I'm, you know, I'm just a knucklehead that came up with an idea. I wanted to find a way to make a living talking about 80s pop culture. And, and I did it. Um, but anybody could be up here on this stage. Anybody could be doing this. And you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna have some fun today. It's gonna be very interactive. And I hope at the end of it that you retain some of the information and that with when the situation presents itself in your life or work, that you remember or you attach that particular solution or that particular situation to one of the lessons, like Prince Akeem from Coming to America and what he taught us. And suddenly you're like, oh my God, this is it. This is the time for this. Yeah. Instead of maybe just a PowerPoint slide that has people shaking hands and you're talking about it in generic terms. Oh my God. Yes. Well, the word PowerPoint just makes me cringe. So, and, but I mean that like that, I think it's what you have to offer and your style of speaking. I've watched a lot of your, um, you know, a keynote speaker, uh, keynote speeches that you've made and it is incredibly engaging and very relevant and fun and easy to absorb because I certainly have sat in on my fair share of, you know, here comes a consultant from ABCD company mm -hmm. or, you know, somebody who's not really, who's just kind of going through the motions and, and presenting maybe because they needed to fill a spot or there's some, you know, box they have to check off on what did they teach the faculty this year or whatever, but your, you know, what you teach people is so valuable and something that you can actually reflect back on and remember too more so than you know anything that i've attended where it was you know just very dry and the speaker wasn't that really into what they were doing they were just doing it because somebody asked them to or they write out ev their whole speech out on um powerpoint slides which is like my worst nightmare and then they pass around <laughs> the packet of their powerpoint that killed yeah. like 500 trees you know uh so i think you, what you've like i said what you've kind of carved out is so unique that I'm not surprised that you know that um, they wanted you to come back because I'm sure that people learned something, retained something, and enjoyed your your presentation. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, I that's you know what I strive for really ultimately, as I said, is just for people to have fun and for it yeah. to be relatable, and then for them to retain some of the information uh, and apply it when the situation uh, presents itself. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's nothing worse than those um, stock. <laughs> you know, stock photos or stock stick figure things on PowerPoint. I just, I, I would like to give like a presentation on why we should just not do that, but that's, we'll save that for uh, <laughs> another time. Um, can you share any stories about a, uh, a memorable uh, speaking event that you had? Yeah, I think for me, ultimately it goes back to the first 
keynote speaking engagement that I had the first time I was actually being paid hmm. to get on stage. And, you know, there's always this moment of nervousness when you first get up, you know, the old kind of Sally field, you, you like me, you really, really like me, <laughs> Yes, but, you know, yes. and you don't know if that's the response you're going to get. And yeah, so there is a bit so of nervousness fun. going up, particularly um, when you, the first time that you're walking on stage and somebody has said, I'm investing my money in you. So I worked in marketing. I worked around events. I know the challenges that event managers face. I, they have one of the toughest jobs. And my goal, one of my goals is really to make them look like a rock star. So that yeah. at the end of the day, everybody says that was a great event. That was a great speaker. And they get all of the accolades. So that's what I want. I want them to get all of the accolades. So I put a lot of pressure on myself. And hmm. I remember that first time getting on stage and, and I felt like my heart, like everybody could see but yeah. not because I was nervous about getting on stage, but just because here I am actually fulfilling this, this idea that I had and yeah. I'm getting ready to talk about eighties pop culture and I'm getting, somebody's paying me for this. Yep. And so I think that moment of first getting up on that stage and doing that and, and saying, you know, walking off the stage and saying, wow, I just, I did it. I pulled it off. I actually yeah. told people I was a speaker and I made it happen. And there's a great lesson there from a movie trading places mm -hmm. that um if anybody's seen you know eddie murphy da oh sorry eddie murphy dan Aykroyd, jamie lee curtis i mean those three alone i think really um, i was gonna say that's like a who's who of of actors and from the 80s and even yeah. relevant today too so 100 percent. and so yeah. those three you know if you hear those three names and they're in a movie together you should probably go ahead and check it out definitely so i won't get too deep into the plot for those that haven't seen it but the 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 idea is that these these two, these two guys, one who's, you know, privileged in this commodities broker situation, a position and one Billy Ray Valentine played by Eddie Murphy, who's this brilliant con man, you yeah. know, who makes his money on the street, but you know, we could argue commodities broker, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're both con men, who knows, but, uh, yeah. but you know, Lewis ends up on the street because of this bet that these two brothers make who run the commodities brokerage. And if you've ever seen coming to America, mm -hmm. there's a little Easter egg in there for those of you that have seen trading places, I won't share what it is, but you'll get it if you see both movies. And, uh, the, the brothers make this dollar bet that if they put Lewis on the street and they bring somebody from the street into the commodities broker could, you know, would each of them actually trade places. Mm -hmm. And so, once we see Billy Ray Valentine, Eddie Murphy's character, we know that he's very smart. We know he can do this job, but he's not so sure himself. And we see this on the first day where he's looking up at the building, getting ready to go to work in this, this brokerage firm. And he looks at uh, Coleman, the butler, and he says, what if I can't do this job? What if I'm not what they expected? Hmm. And Coleman says, just be yourself, sir. They can't take that away from you. Now, if that was the only lesson that we learned to be yourself, that's a pretty good lesson, but it goes deeper than that because again, we've seen how intelligent Billy Ray Valentine is. We know he can do this job. Yeah. And we I talk about the idea of how confident people question themselves, arrogant people question others. Hmm. And um, this is actually- Amen to that. That's so good. <laughs> that's so good. No, really. That's so It's true. actually my third book. Uh, yeah. The newest one, Raised on the 80s. And I, going back to the stage thing, it's the idea of, when you have, you know, we've, we talked about like a, well, you have a lack of self-confidence. If you question yourself, nonsense, how you get better is questioning yourself. And once you stop questioning yourself, well, that means that you think you're good enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that also means a second thing's going to happen. If you think you're good enough and you don't need to question yourself anymore, then when something goes wrong, what are you going to do? You're going to point blame the somebody else. Yep. And you're going to question somebody else. Yep. And that's where the arrogance comes in. I'm it's too good to make a mistake. It must be somebody else. Yeah. And so that idea of getting on stage and constantly questioning yourself, am I going to be good enough? Are yeah. they going to like me? Am I going to miss some content here? Is this the right lesson? That's, these are all good things. When they're going through my head, I know that I'm doing the right things. And I know that I'm going, going to do well that day because I am questioning myself. Yeah. Well, it's like that classic phrase. I don't know if maybe you've heard this before, but you know, when you're pointing the finger, you've got three pointing back at you. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> The um, Spider-Man meme. Yes. He's pointing. Everybody's looked, looks just like and pointing back. Yeah. yeah it's, it's We call it imposter syndrome today, I think. You know, people yes, get yeah. a certain opportunity and they think, why me? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and that's, it's why you, because you're good enough. Yeah. But always remember that you have to continue to question yourself. That's how you're going to get better. And that's how you avoid pointing fingers and getting into the whole circular firing squad that we see right. so much today. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a yeah, very valid point. And I know that happens a lot in, you know, photography. If you don't think you need to keep practicing or, 
you know, taking more photos, you can just, you know, do one gig every once in a blue moon and that's fine. Um, you know, it really doesn't work like that. You have to keep going even if you're decades in. Um, so there's always something to learn and always ways to get better. So yep. I can, yeah, certainly appreciate that. Um, of Out of all of the lessons that you speak about in your books mm -hmm. and in your, your speaking engagements, is there a lesson, I guess you kind of touched on a little bit, but is there a lesson that you think really, really speaks to you the most? speaks to me the most yeah i thought you were gonna ask me like what my favorite one is what speaks to me the most yeah, yeah. We both have, so we'll do that we'll do a kind of a dual one here if that's yeah cool. okay um yeah i think wow the the ones there's a few that speak to me the most and i think we touched on on one of them which is you still have a lot of time to make yourself uh be what you want i think another one uh is from the breakfast club and of course, there's so many lessons from this movie. I mean, yes. it's just yeah, it's time. The, the shirt is the, your shirt is perfect. <laughs> it's at, this is a great scene, by the way. This is yes. probably ten minutes of the best dialogue. Yeah, I would say in movie history when they're sitting there really getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really believe that at tenth or eleventh grade, they should be showing everyone the Breakfast Club. It's such an important movie on so many levels about individuality. Yeah. And Andrew, uh, the athlete played by Emilio Estevez. Yep. You know, we look at him and initially, like when we when we see the five kids, we think, well, he's the one that has no issues, no challenges. He's perfect. He's the athlete. He's popular. He's this. He's that. He's good looking. Right. But deep down there's a lot more going on. And I talk about two lessons there that I think resonate with me a lot. One is from Brian, the brain. And I talk about the idea of like how the really interesting stuff about people is kind of like when we go, if you go diving in the ocean, the really interesting stuff is below the surface and the mm. deeper you go, the cooler stuff you see. Yeah. And I don't think we take time to go deep enough. And Brian was a great example of that. We all looked at him as like, the kid who wasn't going to do anything wrong. He wasn't going to get in trouble. And through the movie, we see him actually coming out of his shell. And there's a really important night. Sometimes I wear the shirt that says, could you describe the ruckus, sir? <laughs> and that's the first moment when Principal Vernon comes in and says, I heard a ruckus. Yeah. And it's not, it's not Bender, the criminal. It's not any of the popular kids. It's Brian mm -hmm. who becomes the smart ass and says, yeah. could you describe the ruckus, sir? And we all of a sudden we see him in a different light. <laughs> Yeah. He's getting his feet underneath of him. He's yeah. his wings are, you know, he's he's expanding his wings. He's coming out of his shell. Yeah. That's a really important moment. And then when I go back to Andrew, he says, We're all a little bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it. That's all. And that one really resonates with me because we talk about the idea that everybody's space. I think people say like everybody's facing something, everybody has a challenge. Sometimes you can't see it. Right. We are all a little bizarre. Yeah. And, you know, and the idea that, that we're, some of us are hiding it, like I, I talk about just be you, you know, especially for kids, be you like people are going, the people who care, the people that matter in your life are going to love you and like you for who you are. And so this is a really important lesson, particularly for kids who might be out, out, up front, you know, the, the teenagers or even the kids in college up front who might be the ones that everybody looks at and says, oh, they, got, they, they don't have any problems. They don't have any issues. Right. Don't be so sure. And so um, I always say, like, just just be you, and uh, that go create you from the outsiders. But also this idea of we're all a little bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it. That's all. I think it's such an important lesson um, that it's okay. We all are a little bizarre. I'm a little bizarre. Right. Probably a lot bizarre. Yeah. You know. So it's, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was a so I was a school counselor for ten years. So that was certainly a conversation. I feel like I had a lot with kids and I would always, you know, point out to them, you know, like, look at my lunchbox. Like I'm a grown woman. I have a dinosaur lunchbox. That's not my, <laughs> that's not my son's lunchbox that I use today. That is my yeah. lunchbox. Cause I like dinosaurs and I don't care. And you're 17 you probably think I'm a big dork, but you know what? It's fine. I've got Ninja Turtles on my bookshelf and Tony Hawk, uh, Tony Hawk poster hanging up. You know, I, don't be afraid to like what you like. Cause I don't, you know, if somebody looks at me and thinks, what, you know, what is that woman doing with the dinosaur lunchbox? And that's probably somebody that I don't really need to, you know, hang out with. Cause what's the, you know, what's the big deal. We should be who you are and like what you like. It's, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. So. Yeah. And that goes back to the daydreaming thing too, you know, yeah. like don't continue to daydream. I and mean, this, this idea that you can't dream during the day is ridiculous you know continue to daydream it's it's you should and and i'm the same way i mean if you look around my house people come over my house and they think 
you know, I got skateboard decks on the wall, old school skateboard decks on the wall. I have, you know, don't you forget about me canvas print above my television. This awesome. is definitely, you know, I mean, it's built for me because this is where I'm comfortable. And so right. I think those are the ones that really resonate with me the most. I do have a great lesson that um, I love and maybe we'll get to it later, but you know, I, um, which I thought, I thought you're gonna ask me like, what's your, what's your favorite lesson? Well, all, but. well yeah, you can, well, aren't you, that would be, uh, that, I think people would like to know that. So okay, yeah, cool. What's your favorite, awesome. yeah, what's your favorite lesson? Yeah, let's hear yeah, it. Yeah, so um, that handwritten note that you talked about earlier. So I, uh, you know, I talk mostly about 80s movies, but I also talk about 80s music. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my favorite musicians was Prince. Yes. Uh, R.I.P. I mean, just, yeah. he was the king of music. We call Michael Jackson the king of pop. Mm -hmm. um, but Prince was the king of music. I don't think um, people realize how much he was doing, yes. not just uh, out front, but also behind the scenes and stuff he was writing for people and the yeah. instruments that he played. In 1987, he was on the biggest stage in the world. I mean, there's no question at this point he had arrived and he was known, if you're known by one name, there's not many people in the world history that have been known by one name. So Very true. You're doing yep. okay. Uh, and he heard a song by Suzanne Vega. Suzanne Vega, who I really liked. I mean, she, you had to really listen to college radio in the 80s to really hear her. Or yes, she had yep. a song called Left of Center on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. Mm -hmm. But then she came that. out with the song, My Name is Luca. Yeah, you know the song Left of Center? I, I didn't really, well, I didn't realize that she was on that soundtrack. Yeah. 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 See, I mean, it's, yep. it was very, you know, because it's, everybody thinks of, you know, the psychedelic fur is pretty in pink. And of course, right. Right. But, um, it's a pretty good soundtrack. And uh, then she came out with the song, my name is Luca. Mm -hmm. uh, I live on the second floor. I live upstairs from me. I'm not going to sing it or everybody's I mean, going to get off this podcast. <laughs> right <now. laughs> yeah. Fast forward. But it's a very serious song um, about child abuse. A kid, you know, the, the story goes that it was a child that lived above her when she was a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, in her, um, you know, her, her complex, and Prince heard the song, and he was so moved by it that he actually penned a handwritten note to her. Hmm. And if you Google Prince and Suzanne Vega, you'll see the handwritten note, okay. and it says, "Dearest Suzanne, Luke is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince." Wow. Yeah. Really, I'm sure she's got that framed somewhere in, like, in a. <laughs> temperature uh, controlled um yeah safety box wow yeah really powerful and if you see the handwriting i mean his handwriting was magical also i i, I could see that he's got this little flower that he did and a little dove on it just really incredible and he's using numbers for words already in 1987 which is maybe he was a time traveler uh maybe. so we know about this because in 2016 when he passed away suzanne vega put it on social media to let people know the kind of guy he was Hmm. Because he wouldn't go out telling people, hey, look at this handwritten note I did. Right. No digital means to get it to her, no email. He Somebody had to deliver that to her. Yeah. So there was an extra step in this process as well. And what we learned from that are, is three things. One is that leaders share the stage of success. You know, where rulers keep everybody below it. They don't want everybody on the stage. They don't want somebody on the stage taking the spotlight from them. No, no, no. Right. Leaders share it. They say, hey, I see you doing great things. I see you greatness. There's room up on this stage for you yeah come on up here and that's what he was doing with her he was letting her know that she was doing great things this is coming from prince right you know somebody who was just again like known by one name and so um here he is letting her know i see you doing great things there's room on this stage for you as well yeah the second thing is encouragement doesn't cost a thing we can all encourage somebody today there's somebody in our life who needs it guaranteed yeah we can all give that little bit of encouragement today. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything to do it. And it'll make a huge difference in that person's life. And the third thing is the handwritten note is a lost art. It's nice to send a nice email to somebody, but mm -hmm. you know, getting that handwritten note from somebody that took the time to do it, no matter how short, uh, yeah. goes a lot further. Yeah. I so agree with that. I think I've also, I've been very conscious of that, especially when it comes to um, grief. And I know that you, you know, you mentioned and um, you dedicated um, you've mentioned you've dedicated you know, books to friends that you've um, lost. And uh, so something I'm trying to be mindful of when I've a friend of mine loses a, whether it's a family member or another friend is to making, you know, making sure to acknowledge that grief in the form of writing them a letter, you know, text is not going to uh, cover it and email is not going to cover it. And I think that that means a lot when people acknowledge 
you know, your your loss or or an accomplishment, you know, in a in a handwritten note or something, I think yeah. really important and and really valuable. And I I certainly hang on to any handwritten things I've gotten from students in the past or clients I've done photos with. If they've sent me a card or something, I always make sure to hang on to that. And if I'm having a you know a bad day or something, something I can look back to and you know always makes me feel better. So the, the power of yeah, the power of the written note is is really invaluable. Yeah, I mean, it was 29 years later when he passed away, and I, I, you know, obviously she kept the note, but she took the time to let people know about it. And so, yeah. would 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 that happen with an email? I I don't know, maybe in the future, but I I doubt it. Yeah, not the same. Yeah, yeah. definitely not the same. Um, okay, let's see. Um, which took okay, cut, cut that part out. Um, so after somebody reads your books or attends what are you know one of your um, keynote speaking events, what's something that you hope that they take away from it? Well, I think on two levels. One is I always talk about how some of the best lessons for life and work are going to come from the most unexpected of places. And so I, I tell people like, look, you're wired to learn. I mean, I don't know. I personally, when I walked into class, maybe I wasn't wired to learn, but most people are kind of like prepared and ready to learn. I'm walking into my class whether mm -hmm. it's history or something else, I'm walking into uh, a meeting where we're going to learn about a new product or a new service. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wired now. I'm dialed in. I'm, I'm wired to learn. I'm yeah. not so sure that that's the best way to retain things. Mm -hmm. I feel like because we're we, we can get so focused, we almost get unfocused, if that's really a word. I mean, yeah. we have a lack of focus because we're trying to get so focused. And so I don't know that it's the best environment. I think when we don't expect to learn something, we do. Hmm. And so that's why I think 80s pop culture is such a great place and so rich in, in lessons because when we hear that Jeff Spicoli of all people can teach us things for work and life, we think no way. Yeah. But then when we actually hear it and we think, oh, wow, you know what? He, he can. That's totally unexpected. And I do think it finds a place in your brain where you remember it and you're able mm -hmm. to associate it with something that you didn't expect. Yeah. And so I think that's one thing that I want people to walk away with is that you're going to probably learn your best lessons for life and work when you don't expect it. Yeah. And those are the ones that you're going to, uh, to retain. Yeah. And so I think that's a really important thing that I want people, you know, to remember through throughout, um, my, my keynote presentations. And then from an eighties pop culture perspective, I, I really want people, you know, I'm biased because of course I love eighties pop culture, but I, I hard do. Not, it's hard. It's so hard not to, it's, in, it's impossible not to. It really is. And I, and I think you bring up a really good point, you know, that it's impossible not to, because yeah. I want people to walk away understanding a little better about why 80s pop culture has really captured us so much. And it continues to capture us even 43 years removed mm -hmm. from 1980. That nostalgia comes in 30 year cycles typically, and then it fades. Yeah. And here we are in 2023 and it's only getting stronger. The influence of 80s pop culture. I mean, I was just turned off my TV before we hopped on and there was a TurboTax commercial with the safety dance. Oh, geez. I mean, <laughs> this is just wow. not going away. Uh, no. And I want people to hopefully walk away with a new appreciation for 80s pop culture and that it goes a lot deeper than just what you hear and what you think. And that I say that 80s pop culture was like somebody took a glitter bomb and threw it against a wall and all these wonderful colors came out. And that was all of the, the, the different types of genres in music and movies, even in television, but really in movies and music that came out of the eighties mm -hmm. and that there was this, a lot of experimentation going on because for the first time people had access to be able to create their own things. There were camcorders, you know, I mean, obviously <laughs> oh, a camcorder wasn't cheap, no. but it was the first time that people could actually access something and be able to create their own things. L.O. Mm -hmm. I think talks about, how you know he was able to make his mixtapes and sell them out of the trunk of his uncle's car. And I could be, if somebody yeah. fact checks me on that, I could be wrong, but I think that's the story he tells. That wasn't happening before the, the 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of opportunities that didn't exist before. And what happened with that? Well, all of these genres, we had a little bit of hip hop before the 80s. There was the Sugar Hill Gang, and sure. I think Curtis Blow may have been like late 70s. Yep. But then in the 80s, there was, I mean, the, the hip hop became 10 different genres. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, everything from Young MC to NWA. I mean, yeah. you had whatever you wanted to, to a tribe called Quest. 
So there was everything that you that you would want. And then the same thing for like metal music. There was everything from Metallica yep. to Poison. Mm -hmm. uh, and lots of hair and hairspray. Lots of hair and hairspray. Yes, like there's a hole in the ozone layer, I think, because of you know, <laughs> yeah. Bon Jovi and yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. A lot, a lot of hairspray. Yeah. And uh, and then even, you know, further into music, you had I tell people, go look at the top 40 from any month of any week of any year in the 80s. Pick 1984, June 20th, top 40. And you'll see Kenny Rogers next to LL Cool J, yeah. next to Depeche Mode, next to Motley Crue, and then we'll throw in some Debbie Gibson. Mm -hmm. Something for everyone was really in uh, even the top 40 back then. Yeah, And then movies, of course, like, you know, we had rom-coms, I think, I talk about how Marilyn Monroe, people, they remember the posters and obviously her iconic photos. People overlook that she was a great comedic actress. Hmm. And if you go back and you watch Some Like It Hot and some of her other movies, comedy is really hard to do. And she had great timing. So there were rom-coms before the 80s, but man, they just exploded in the 80s. Yeah. Coming of age movies exploded in the 80s. Yeah. The action movie. Mm -hmm. really kind of grew up in the 80s oh definitely and, yeah right so i i want people to appreciate the history of 80s pop culture and then i think they understand why it almost stands alone it's just different from any other decade before and any other decade after yeah yeah we, we talked i think offline about you know why the 80s um you know resonates with so many people and i i think part of it might also just be that we were very present for that time to sort of take it all in, you know, because there weren't 5,000 channels to watch there, you know, you couldn't choose from 5,000 movies on your TV to watch, you know, you had to be very physically present to absorb that sort of physical media or, um, you know, to listen to something. If you were going to put on a record and listen to it, you probably weren't going to be, you know, using your phone or, you know, texting somebody or whatever. You were kind of just very present on what you were doing, you know, and I think that's, I think why people are so nostalgic for that time is because they weren't distracted by 5,000 things. Um, there weren't as many choices. You know, if you wanted to watch that TV show, well, you better be, you know, ready at seven o'clock on Saturday to watch it because that's the only time you're going to be able to view it, you know? Um, so I think that kind of adds to the, like, you know, like if you wanted to watch Golden Girls, well, you better be available on, you know, Saturday or Sunday or whatever. I think it started on a Saturday uh, rotation. You know, you have to be, you need to watch it and sit there and be present because it's not going to come on again. So you absorb the whole show and, you know, how hilarious it was because you were, you know, sitting there and you were present for it. That's a great point. Uh, that That's an excellent point. The the lack of distractions and, you know, that that when something was on, you needed to watch it. And that was your chance that you had. And if you rented a movie, you had two days and then they were going to start charging you late fees. So, right. you uh, yeah, you really that's a really, really good point. And I, I think also, you know, these the younger generations is when I when I do my keynote speeches, um, the two generations come up to me the most, obviously Gen X, mm -hmm. but then people in their 20s. Yes. Are really embracing. I think Stranger Things and Cobra Kai have certainly helped. Yeah. Uh, but there is something to be said, you know, I, you know, I have my, I love technology and in, in the palm of my hand that I can access everything. But I also think I miss the romanticism of walking into a blockbuster and not knowing if I was going to get the movie that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there is an advantage that, that people in their twenties have today in terms of, you know, really once they've embraced well, I'll give you an example. Stranger Things. So let's say that we talked about Pretty in Pink earlier. Let's say the psychedelic mm -hmm. first song, Pretty in Pink, comes on a show like Stranger Things. Oh, I love that song. So they type in Pretty in Pink in Google. Hmm. And suddenly they're like, oh, wow, okay, psychedelic furs, cool. Oh, if I like the psychedelic furs, I might like The Smiths, The Pesho, yeah. The Cure. Okay, let me check these out. Wow, these are cool. Wait a yeah. minute, Pretty in Pink was a movie? Really? Mm, let me check this out. Oh, yeah. I like Pretty in Pink. Here's some movies you might like. Yeah, Ferris Bueller, Breakfast Club, all done by, you know, 16 Candles, all done by this guy, John Hughes, who also did Pretty in Pink. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I'll check those out. Now, that's, I'm yeah, learning that's true. all this stuff about East pop culture. Me or you, if I wanted to learn about Led Zeppelin or The Doors when I was, you know, 14 years old in 1984, I had to go to the guy sitting on his Camaro in the ripped off jeans jacket, smoking a cigarette <laughs> with the Led Zeppelin patch. And you know what yeah. I'm not going to do? I'm not asking him. Right. I don't know. Is he going to kick my ass? I have no idea. Like, right. 
you know, is going to like get away from me, you know, dork. I don't, I don't know. And right. my parents, I'm not going to ask them because I'm 14. Why would I ask my parents anything? Right. So, go to, go check out the card catalog or the microfiche and be maybe micro option number three. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's so very micro, true. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true about the, um, about the younger crowd. So I, um, there's a really great book out. Um, it's, it's called an, it's analog something. It's a really, I, I'll have to look it up and I'll put it in the, the show notes. But um, one thing he's talking about is, you know, people are yearning for this, you know, analog lifestyle and, you know, mm -hmm. being more interactive and involved in stuff. And a lot of the reasons why things like Walkmen have made a comeback and film cameras and stuff like that is because of people that are in their 20s that are really wanting this sort of, you know, more involved, less digital, um, you know, interaction with things, which I can, you know, certainly appreciate because yeah. they've all grown up using phones to take pictures. They've all just had like MP3 or whatever, you know, digital media. They've never had a physical, you know, cassette tape or a record or whatever. So that's really driving the sales of all this stuff. And the prices have gone up for things that, um, you know, on like eBay and, you know, somebody wants to get like an original Walkman, you know, um, and I had a million Walkman and a Discman and everything, but, you know, these, I think younger adults want that experience too. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. And I, and I, it's pretty cool to see. And I do think, I want to point out one more thing too, that I think might could be contributing to why particularly people in their twenties are really going back and embracing eighties pop culture. And this, I mean, I, I would imagine we got another five or 10 years of this. Like, I mean, when you think about the movies, Beverly Hills cop four coming out with Eddie Murphy here in the fall mm. as Axel Foley, no one else could be Axel Foley. I mean, you just have to retire that character. If yes. Not around. Amen. Yes. Uh, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons movie that's coming out that I'm really excited about is going to really kind of bring some of the eighties stuff back when it comes to fantasy. I'm really, really excited about that movie. Yeah. I think part of it too is that, and this isn't a bad thing, okay? Most, the vast majority of 80s movies had a happy ending. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's true, yes. It's okay. Yep. You know, we mm -hmm. don't have to always be so serious and yes. so real. Yes, there should be, you know, I, I would argue like if you ever watch The Last American Virgin, it's not a happy ending and it's probably like the most real ending to an 80s movie, just that feeling we've all had where, we we crushed on somebody and they wanted to be with somebody else and it's just mm -hmm. this, this this feeling this overwhelming feeling of just sadness yeah but most of the 80s movies had a uh, happy ending and now yeah. i think it's it's for a long time it was always like let's make sure that we're you know very cynical and that you know that we 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 kill off the characters that everybody loves yeah and we make them hurt for that for that okay i feel like there's a place for that sure i i appreciate that storytelling but there is something to be said for knowing that at the end, the people that you want to be happy are going to be happy. Yeah. That's okay. Yep. And I, th I think we, we've missed some of that for a while. And I do think that 80s, 80s movies in particular really bring that back and remind people that it is okay to, to have a story end happily. Some stories actually do in real life. Right. And so that's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree with that. And I think that's just good. I always joke that, um, you know, I don't really want to watch anything. I don't want to watch anything scary because I don't find that entertaining <laughs> is I either want to laugh or learn something. Um, and I think that that was, you know, just very commonplace in a very good way um, in 80s movies. I was just, for some reason, the movie, some kind of wonderful just came, yeah. you know, into my head and, you know, him yelling Watts at the end and just how like, you know, it's like, this is perfect. I'm, you know, this was like a funny movie and, um, you know, I like the characters and they, you know, the two kind of hometown kids end up together and I'm totally okay with that. And now I can go to sleep peacefully, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I don't want to totally. be stressed out or sad or, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I agree. And I, and I think that's part of the allure, but you know, it's what people say, you know, eighties movies, some eighties movies could be so cheesy. Yeah, they could, but yeah. that's okay. The part right. of that, part of it is that they, they had so many happy endings that it felt like a little cheesy that's perfectly fine. And I think people are showing that, you know, when they go see movies like Creed mm -hmm. and they go see Top Gun and some of these other movies that they have the ending that we're hoping for. That's not a bad thing. You know, yeah. it actually is not a bad thing. When you go see the Creed movies, I love. And when you you know he's going to win at the end, mm -hmm. that's perfectly fine. Like, that's okay to, to right. know, kind of know what the ending is going to be. That's all right. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I think that people are, you know, they're, they're people, a lot of people are wanting that again. They're wanting those happy endings and it's okay. Right. And I think the rewatchability factor when it is that way is, um, 
says something too. I mean, the number of times that I've watched, you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off and The Breakfast Club and, you know, uh, Pretty in Pink um, being definitely up there too. I mean, this the rewatchability factor, I think, is also something that we don't see a lot now either. Um, Road, Roadhouse. You know? Yeah. Roadhouse. Oh, that's right. Yes, I remember, yeah, I remember re reading that you were a big Patrick uh, Swayze Huge. fan. And I also meant to say, I forgot to write this down, but I know you mentioned um, you're a big fan of Mr. T. A huge fan. and my dad so my dad is um meet my dad's in the 70s now but uh he was a he's like a fourth degree black belt um very you know good martial artist all the stuff and he was actually a bouncer in chicago in the 70s and so was mr t so he like worked with him um oh he did that's awesome. yes yeah making sure that you know kind of the um you know sketchy people were uh you know gently removed from uh nightclubs and stuff but yes he has he's got many uh mr t uh stories pre you know, gold necklaces and stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah. you heard a lot, heard a lot about Mr. T growing up. Pain. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I actually bounced the bars as well in my. Oh, early nice. 20s, so I know about like the gentle removal. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's why I probably love Roadhouse so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. T. I love. I, I, you know, Clubber Lang for my money is he is one of the greatest villains in movie history. He hmm. just was perfect. He played yeah. the role perfectly yeah and i i don't know i just i have it's why rocky three is one of my favorite movies because of mr t yeah by yeah, the way so you mentioned good. walkman's i have i don't know you probably took difficulty seeing that let me see if i'm oh, oh oh nice oh god i wanted i think yes i wanted one of those but yeah 1985 that one yeah um yeah so i i love mr t that's so cool that your dad actually bounced with him and yes wow what a I mean, just to kind of almost in some ways walk off the street and become that iconic character and then yes. end up with a great career. So amazing. So awesome. Yeah. Who, who, and he had his own cereal. I mean, that, if that doesn't tell you, I mean, that's when you know you've made it. When you have your own <laughs> cereal box, cereal. cereal, even if it lasts for like a year, um, which I'm sure that's what happened with Mr. T cereal. Uh, that's <laughs> so that's saying something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He was great. Clubber Lang. Fantastic yeah. character. Yeah. 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 He's such a, he's such a likable, great, um, yeah, great actor. Um, we've got a few minutes left here. So there's a other, a few other questions here. Um, are there any eighties fashions that you think should be, you know, not allowed to make a comeback? They should be banned. Can't sell them. Can't buy them. <laughs> Anything a on lot, that list? A lot. <laughs> okay. A lot. Uh, parachute pants is one mm -hmm. that comes to the top of my head. I don't think those should ever come back. Yeah. Uh, members only jackets. I maybe, I don't know. They're not too bad. I, I don't know. I think, I think parachute pants for me, it was like the, the, um, the pinnacle of really bad 80s mm -hmm. fashion. I think it was a lot of the haircuts too. Like the rat tail. I don't think that. Yeah. Oh God. The rat tail <laughs> that I just, <laughs> that I should make a comeback. Um, I, you know, I can only speak to more of the men's fashion, which yeah. I think, uh, wasn't quite as um amazing shall we say yeah as some of the women's fashion yep. the neon is actually in moderation is okay but we went way overboard i remember wearing you know neon shirt and jams mm -hmm. jam shirt and these neon shorts that were different color neon yes each other mm -hmm. but i thought it was super cool so um yeah I think most of the fashion probably shouldn't come back. The really short shorts, please don't do that. Oh God. Of us. Yeah. The, the, yeah. You talked about, you talked about the video camera. So yeah, my dad had um, a humongous, uh, you know, VHS um, camcorder that I'm sure weighed like 30 pounds. And uh, so he of course filmed a ton of stuff, which I'm now very grateful for, but I think every once in a blue moon, he'd allow us to turn the camera on him. And I certainly have some uh, blackmail footage of him and some pretty, you know, teeny tiny shorts, which are pretty standard, but it's like, oh my God, how could you even like sit yeah. down or like, it just, oh my God, it's just, uh, yeah, they were, unacceptable. yeah, 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 they were, the shorts were really short. And I, yeah. I still look back at some of the pictures I have of, of me in those, in those little shorts. And I think, man, what, what were my parents thinking putting in some of these clothes? And, you know, especially yeah. when I was younger and I didn't have a choice, like here are your clothes. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, socks pulled up and yeah, yeah. socks pulled up. Now I will say that one of the fashions that started in 1966 but exploded onto the scene in the 80s because of Jess Piccoli and Fast Times are Vans. Hmm. Now Vans are awesome. Yes. Vans are one of the greatest I'm, brands of all time. Oh yes, I still I'm the 
proud owner of several pairs. Me too. I have, I think, six pairs in my closet right now. I just got a um, a pair that uh, is a Cobra Kai pair, and nice. uh, it has like strike hard, strike first, uh, strike first, strike hard. Yeah, strike strike hard, strike strike first, strike hard, no mercy mm -hmm. on them, as well as uh, Cobra Kai on the bottom. And yeah, they're really cool. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I'm trying to think, you mentioned the, so the, for me, I think the list of things to not come back is definitely, I think the over, ex, you know, excessive neon, definitely, because like you said, I mean, I think I had like two-tone neon shorts with a, you know, a, a neon shirt that did not match. So just like full on, you know, neon ready to run a marathon, I guess, in the middle of the night and be seen by cars, <laughs> apparently. Um, and I know like Cavarici yeah. pants. Um, oh my God. Which I talked yeah. about on, yeah, on a previous episode of like some extinct uh, mall stores and those have actually made a comeback not so much on the like new market but on like the used market people spending a lot of money buying those on you know ebay you know bidding on some stonewash cavarici pants you know with the, just a tiny waist and big legs i just you know That's very unflattering why. oh yeah 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 i i i think it there's a there was a quite a bit of fashion i wouldn't bring back but it was really a lot of the hairstyles i just i yeah. look back now and i just laugh at some of the hair and i think how why? Why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was the time. And again, it goes back to the explosion of individuality and creativity in the 80s. And I think that's what drove so many of the different styles. And, you know, to a certain extent, I'm glad that we had all the stuff that people look back and think that was just really bad fashion, really <laughs> bad hair. Because what it did, it, 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 we, we didn't really talk about this, but when we talked yeah. about music and movies for everybody. You think about all the different groups in the 80s. You know, in the 70s, there might have been, I don't know, three different types of groups in your high school. In the 80s, there was probably 15. Mm -hmm. And they were very, like, identifiable. I mean, you know, you could see yes. the, like the goths, for example. And, yes. But the cool thing was that all of those groups tended to introduce, particularly when it came to music, music to all the other groups. So without the kids that were kind of goth in my school, I may not have really even listened to Depeche Mode. Mm -hmm. I may not even have heard Depeche Mode or New Order. Yeah. Or, you know, even if we're going to go deeper, like Danzig, you know, I would have, these oh, are yes. groups, oh, yeah, I love Danzig. Yeah. I, wouldn't yeah. even, I wouldn't have heard that music if not for these kids who maybe were doing things a little, di di had different hobbies or interests than I had, but I would hear them listen to some music and I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, And then I would listen to it. I'm like, and it would take me to, you know, some other music. So right. there's something to be said for all of that. I think it was great. Yeah. Here's a, here's a mixtape I made you of uh, dancing and yeah, Depeche Mode. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a really great point. Um, yeah. We definitely, uh, goths were a big, uh, big in my school for sure. Um, that was a whole style and, yeah. you know, um, and they all kind of had their friends and they were all cool with dyeing their hair and spiking their hair and all, yeah. you know, it yeah. just, just however you wanted to and it was okay yeah um, and that was like you know again the binders that we had people would put like their their the bands they listened to like the logos on their binder yes and so you didn't even really have to necessarily in that situation like you could see on somebody's binder you would see like new order and you think what is that you know mm -hmm. and so it would lead you to maybe have a conversation with that person that Potentially, maybe you guys would just go in different directions. You know, the "Don't You Forget About Me" song. You know, if you see me, will you walk on by? You know, and maybe yeah. when, typically you would have walked on by, but you asked the question like, "What? What is that? What is New Order?" You know, you were maybe weren't afraid to ask the questions of people who were at your level in terms of age. Yeah. You know, when I was talking earlier about the senior versus me in ninth grade and saying, "Hey, yeah. what's, what's that plan?" He's like, "Get away, yeah. kid! Blow smoke <laughs> in my face!" You know. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Go. Yeah, go. Skid their wheels and uh, ride right off into the. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh, what a great time that was. Um, so, you know, I think because of your, what you do for a living, you've met a lot of really interesting um, celebrities from the, yeah. the 80s that were well known and still, you know, well known today. Any celebrity encounters that stand out to you as being memorable? One yeah. Or the other? Yes, for sure. Before I even started this, probably the most amazing moment I had, and it's captured in a picture and I still can't find it. And when we, uh, my sister and I have probably next this summer, we're going to have to go clean up my mom's house at some point. And, um, I'm going to find it. I'm determined to find this picture of me and Andre the giant. Oh, geez. Yes. I was eight years old. Yes. And you wrote about, yeah, you wrote about him in your, yeah. your book as well. I yeah. had the autograph. I found the autograph. 
I can't find the picture. And I remember he had his head, his hand on my head, which made my head look like a coffee mug. Yeah. Um, he just, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, before I started all this, that was an amazing moment to meet Andre the giant. Um, mm -hmm. as I'll kind of go through chronological. The next big moment for me was when I was 13 and my dad took me out to LA. He had a small production company and he had some work out there. So he took me out there and I remember I'm a 13 year old boy and I was, uh, watching the fall guy. If you remember that show? And I had mm -hmm. a huge crush on Heather Thomas Yep. and I got to meet her, you know, sure. Her poster was on my wall in my bedroom and I get to meet Heather Thomas. Wow. Uh, I was speechless. I didn't say anything to her. I couldn't yeah. get the words out. I just yeah. was kind of in shock. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I wish I would have been a little bit older, or at least I would have maybe said something like, hello, but I yeah. couldn't. Even say <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure so, when you're that age. Yeah. And I got to meet her in 2019 again at a nostalgia con eighties nostalgia con where I was speaking as well. And she was, she had a booth there and I got a chance to meet her and tell her that story of you know, not remember, not, and I'm sure I wasn't the only teenage boy that, you know, met her and was speechless. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, 13 and then moving forward with what I do today, uh, meeting Corey Feldman and Sean Astin was really cool. I had a chance nice. to moderate a Goonies reunion panel. Oh, amazing. Uh, that was a lot of fun, uh, because, you know, watching them, the two of them interact and knowing that I have a picture with the two of them and you can see side by side, how very different their paths and journeys yeah. have been through the mm -hmm. last 30 years. Um, but how they just were like right back in that time again together. Yeah. Yeah. Really what a cool. history those two. Oh my gosh. Yeah. A lot of wow. history. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then that same conference, I moderated an MTV VJ reunion panel. Oh, geez. So nice. I got to meet, uh, Mark Goodman, Alan Hunter and Nina Blackwood. And, wow. uh, that was yeah. really cool too, to spend some time with them and have conversations about, you know, MTV when, when it was actually music videos. And oh my God. Some of their stories was really cool. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh so I, that brings up a question like MTV. Was mm -hmm. there a particular video or videos that you uh, would wait for to come on? Like you just like, I got, I got to record this or I, I can't wait for this one to come on. Yeah. I think, you know, when, whenever Michael Jackson released music videos, you know, that was like a whole big event. Um, yeah. I remember waiting to, you know, it was like a big deal because there'd be some like pre show beforehand before they got into it. I remember like when, you know, black and black or white came out. Yeah. Um, but I know one music video that I had to record and I watched till probably the tape broke um, was take on me by aha. Cause I think oh, I went yeah. through this phase where I just wanted to be able to draw and I, I mean, didn't invest much time in trying to figure that out, but I'm a you know horrible, horrible artist. I have other talents. It's fine. I've got other strengths. Um, drawing is not one of them. Terrible artist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think I was just very envious of the artwork in that. And I loved the song. Um, and now my my I have an eight year old son who's obsessed with that song, and he's um he's on the autism spectrum, so he gets very fixated on things. So I have heard that song. <laughs> I think it's karma. Um, coming back because I <laughs> uh, demanded to listen to it all the time as a kid, and um. Yeah, I think that's the one music video that, you know, anything by, yeah, the, that music video and then anything by um, Janet Jackson, classic Janet Jackson control yeah. of Rhythm Nation, um, because I love uh, choreography and I find her choreography to be very um, timeless. And even now, um, you know, she's probably at the top of my, probably my favorite um, musician of all time. So anything by her, I um, adore, whether it's from the 80s, 90s, anytime. I love Janet Jackson. So how about you? Yeah, mine were, well, I agree, Michael Jackson, like Thriller. I just could not yes. get enough of, of that video, as most people, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Van Halen videos. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really, I couldn't wait for, you know, like, Hot for Teacher to come on. I love that yes. video. Any yeah. videos that were funny, Twisted Sister. Yes. Um, you know, we're not yep. going to take it. I want to rock. Because they always had, like, a funny opening or something that was, like, it almost felt like a little bit like a mini movie. Oh, so those yes. are the ones that I like really look forward to. Yeah. I mean, it was like um, a little, yeah, exactly. It's like a little movie. I mean, it was amazing. The detail and the storytelling yeah. and the sets and I mean, everything now it's just, I mean, music videos just aren't a huge no. marketing tool anymore. Um, so it's certainly not, um, not what it used to be, but yeah, I could have watched MTV all day. I remember when my mom got rid of cable and we couldn't watch like the real, like uh, the original real world, um, you know, we were so mad. 
um, that she got rid of that, that we <laughs> gave her, uh, oh my God, we gave her so much grief for it for so long. Like, oh my God, you got rid of MTV now. It's like, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you the last time I watched MTV probably, I mean, 20, yeah, I, 20 years ago, who even knows? Cause there's nothing, uh, nothing I can relate to. Nothing. I mean, it's just uh, not what it used to be. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely had, I definitely had videos that I, I really couldn't wait no matter how many times I watched them, you know, it felt like it was the first time every single time. And again, it goes back to what you talked about earlier, how, you know, we didn't have everything at our fingertips. So we had to wait. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the show that I looked forward to always was 100, 120 minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh God. Yes. That would introduce me to so really good. Like, new music, you know, yeah, so I was like used to like new alt music, which was cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they MTV really knocked it out of the park then. I mean, with just ex the music exposure and the, I mean, the documentaries they did, they did yeah. so much during the the AIDS crisis to educate yeah. people. I mean, it's just, I mean, groundbreaking journalism and exposure and everything. And now it's like, what happened? What happened? It's so, I mean, everything has to evolve and change, but my God, if anything has changed like completely, that would be it. I mean, my God, I it just, it's, it's, it's sad. Make Shame. it make sense. Make it make sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Teach. Yeah. Teach people something. Expose them to cool stuff. Not, you know. Yeah. Oh, and that's. Yeah. yeah. Like that could be a whole. You're right. Yeah. Thing. It was. It was actually like a like a, it was a, culture channel and a lot mm -hmm. more, a lot more than just music. But when they didn't do music, they were talking about, things that mattered. Right. Um, which they don't do anymore. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's lame. So lame. <laughs> um. All right. Well, we just have a few um, minutes here. I'll just yeah. ask, um, are there any movies, this is this is a tough one to say, you know, are there any 80s movies that you find are overrated? Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, if I really thought about it, I could probably list quite a few that I think are overrated. And yeah, um, I think for a second about, I'm trying to think of ones that might people would say like, that's a really great movie. It's super popular or maybe a super popular movie that mm -hmm. I just didn't get. Mm -hmm. um, wow. This is, this is going to upset some people. I don't want to <laughs> say it's overrated, but I'm not a huge fan of the star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. Return of the Jedi empire strikes back. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, they're well done, but I, maybe I just didn't get the joke in terms of the, the, the mass appeal yeah, uh, the movies themselves and and how it's cool that they've created this world and this culture. It's really awesome, but it wasn't for me. So yeah. I think that, that those are ones I'll tell you another one. Well, I can't say that it's overrated because I've never seen it. Okay. I have well, a reason for it. Yeah. I can share. Well, not, yeah, sure. Not motivated to see it. That's fine. People can throw rotten tomatoes at their iPhones or whatever. <laughs> if they get upset. <laughs> the one that I haven't seen that people get really upset about is dirty dancing. Hmm. That's yep. That's on my list. I've seen that movie and I just did not care for it um, at all. I just, I don't understand why it's such a, maybe it's something I had to have seen a ton of times when I was younger and now I'd be like nostalgic for it. But when I did see it, I was like this, you know, they don't have good chemistry. And I think that's been noted that, you know, they didn't really get along with on set or whatever. And, and uh, not that it really matters, but it just kind of comes through. And the story is just not that interesting. Um, yeah, if somebody's like, oh, we're going to watch Dirty Dancing tonight, I'd be like, eh, I think I'll find something else to do. Yeah. Um, I'm not yeah. a big fan of that movie either. Uh, it just doesn't, it's, doesn't um, do it for me. I love Patrick Swayze, as you mentioned earlier. He's one yeah. of my favorites. And yeah. and I you know, I named my dog Bodie after his character in Point Break. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I really do love Patrick Swayze and, you know, Pretty much all of his movies. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Roadhouse. Um, huge fan of obviously Point Break, Red Dawn. I mean, I just really enjoy a lot of his movies. The um, reason for Dirty Dancing for me is because I graduated high school in 1988, and mm -hmm. the theme of our prom was now I had the time of my life. Oh, geez. Oh, I could. Yeah, that makes now that. Yep. I wanted Home Sweet Home from Motley Crue. Um, I mm. was outvoted on that. Uh, and so yep. I had to hear that song like a hundred times that night. Oh geez. And yeah. It, um, it was on all the party favors. And I tell the story that when I used to work at Disney for a short time, I, my friends came down and we all went to the parks and for some ridiculous reason we went on, it's a small world mm -hmm. and it broke down and we were stuck in, it's a small world for 30 minutes while the dolls just kept singing. Oh geez. Yes. After all. 
<laughs> I, I have night terrors about that. Like you could make a short horror film. Yes. About that. I have night terrors about not had the time of my life because mm -hmm. I heard it so many times and I'm just, I can't watch the movie now. And people yeah. say, Oh, you can just turn it down. Just mute it. No, no. Yeah. I can't do it. I just can't do it. You know, I mean, I, it's understandable. I, I have this incredible affinity for Patrick Swayze, but sorry, Patrick can't, can't watch that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think save for save the best for last may have been, um, around when I was like some of the school dances or whatever by, uh, Vanessa Williams. That was, yeah. that was a big, oh my God, that I can't okay. stand that song either. I Just kind of those song. Yeah. Those like uh, slow jam, the slow hits of like the eighties and nineties that would be on like a, you know, compilation CD are just no. Um, that's funny that I worked for Disney too. When I, uh, after I graduated from high school, um, which is a long and short story. Um, but I think the movie that people will probably be very angry for me for saying this, but I think again, cause I didn't, I grew up watching pretty in pink and fair Spielers day off. Those are like, you know, like, it's like a religion to me watching those movies. It's just classic and so good. But the movie that I can't stand is St. Elmo's Fire, which I know people are going to, I just, I just, uh, it just doesn't, I don't know. Those, I don't know if it's the story, the romantic relationships don't really work for me. Um, you know, Judd Nelson's kind of like a, uh, kind of a jerk in that movie and Demi <laughs> Moore's weird scene yeah. where she's like shaking and there's silk. And I just, I just can't, <laughs> it's like, I just don't, doesn't, it seems like they're all eating at, um, I'm trying to think what the name is, like, it seemed like they're all like hang out at a ground round restaurant. Um, <laughs> and ground then at the end, there's like rescue her and the wind, you know, the windows are all open. It's like, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't. Yeah. Listen, that's great that you bring up staying almost fire because it's, it's in order for a movie, in order for you kind of to not like a movie that you have to, to find one that, that is very popular and say, I just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think that's totally understandable. It's a great cast. It's a, it's yes, a great phenomenal cast. cast. And actually like, you know, the, the theme song is pretty good. Like the, the music's pretty good, but yeah, I, I don't disagree with you that they missed and I think they missed an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I actually enjoy sentinel with fire, but I understand yeah. how someone could say like, I didn't get it. Yeah, you know, I, I talk about '90s movies. You know that I I never got the joke with Pulp Fiction, mm -hmm. and I'm a huge Tarantino fan. True Romance is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, uh, Christian Slater, Clarence Worley. I just love that character. Uh, yeah, but I but I didn't get the joke with with Pulp Fiction. So I I understand like when there's a really huge movie and right, you just don't you just no no that's not not one that I got. Right. So, yeah. And, so, and, if, and if it's like a movie, it's like, you know, I think I could have done a pretty good job of like sitting in an empty apartment with like the windows open with curtains, <laughs> like a bunch of stuff playing around. In. I could have also done that. And I have, you know, no acting ability or training whatsoever. So, um, yeah, that's how I, that's how I base it. Um, well, I know we're uh, getting a little uh, short here on time, but I guess my last question is where can people find you if they want to learn more about your books? or your keynote speaking or yeah. any of your other appearances, where, where can people find you? I appreciate it. Uh, I want to yeah. say just because we talked about ones, we didn't like the couple underrated ones for people. Yeah. Sure. Vision, Vision quest is one. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that are younger, you know, uh, Matthew Modine is also in stranger things. So oh, uh, that's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he plays father. She calls him father. I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, vision quest. And you also get another bite at the Jake Ryan apple, because if you like Jake Ryan from 16 candles, he, he kind of left Hollywood after that, but he did Vision Quest as well. Uh, so Vision Quest, Lucas, really mm. great underrated movie. That is, yes. Um, highly recommend that, especially for people that have kids. Yes. Really, really great movie about bullying. Uh, so Vision Quest, Lucas, and then Three O'Clock High would be another one um, mm. that I would recommend. So okay. those three, um, good, good, good movies, underrated 80s movies. Yeah. So yeah, Definitely. where people can find me. Uh, my website, chrisclues.com, C-L-E-W-S.com. Uh, on social media, I was lucky enough to get at 80s pop culture as my handle on Twitter. I don't know how that was available, but it was. <laughs> nice, I don't spend yes. a lot of time on Twitter because it's, it. I just, usually what I have to say takes a little bit longer than what Twitter allows in terms of content. Mm -hmm. So spend more time on Instagram, which yeah. is uh, at Chris Clues 80s. And then Facebook, you can find me just at Chris Clues. Um, so I have my, my personal page and my author speaker page, but I tell people to come to my personal page because I just do 80s content for the most part Yeah, uh, there. And then LinkedIn, uh, Chris Clues as well. And so, uh, yeah, you can find all my contact info on my website. You can learn a little bit more about me, see my videos, my content. 
and uh, let's have a chat. I mean, I'm, you know, as I said, I've spoken to some fairly large organizations, DHL being one, Visa being another, yeah. uh, UPenn Medicine, as I mentioned a couple of times, University of Florida, their, their uh, communication school spoke to them as well, a number of associations uh, across the country, and I absolutely love it. I can assure you, uh, my first priority is you, if you hire me, and making sure that you look great as the event planner, event manager, whomever you may be, whether it's the director of HR in an organization. My first priority is to make you look great. You tell me what you need me to do and uh, to make you look good, and I will make sure to do it. Yeah, well, that's really nice that you, you know, have that perspective too, because that is, you know, a tough, um, tough position to be in, like you said, because if, you know, if something doesn't go over or whatever, you know, they'll certainly let the, you know, the, the planner in charge um, hear yeah. about it. So that's nice that you take that into consideration um, for sure. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time and for being on the show. It's been really nice getting to know you and speaking with you and reading your um, fantastic books. Um, and, you know, anytime you ever want to come back on, you're always welcome. I appreciate it, Amy. And thanks again. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad that, you know, just kind of doing a Google search, I found you and yeah, like, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot and see if she'll have me on. So, um, so yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Anytime. Thanks, Chris. Stay rad, everybody. All right.